Hello, I'm Jim Halfpenny, and I welcome you to A Gathering of Naturalists. A Gathering is hosted by A Naturalist World, an ecological education company located at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Our company sponsors educational programs and research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We also host this free lecture series, A Gathering of Naturalists, which highlights the knowledge and expertise of those who live, study, and love the ecosystem. Now, please join us for our program. So tonight's gonna to be the Canada Links of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, the, not just the park, it's gonna be of the whole ecosystem because I wanna throw in some of the stuff of Wyoming game and fish and stuff that happens south of the park also. But the lynx, they're the bob-tailed cats. And bobbed means that it's cut off kind of short, very short, uh, compared to the cougars and the jaguarundi. And uh, I think you can probably see my pointer on here, the little bobtail on the bobcat. Uh, one of the key elements here is notice how small its foot is compared to that canda lynx with the huge foot. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But here is the long leg of the lynx with its big foot. Lynx typically have uh, long tufts on the ears and are gray in color. The mountain bobcat also has gray hair and tufts on the ears and only those big feet and the black tip on the tail back here. That black tip is just the diagnostic characteristic. When people are reporting a lynx to us, and I'll say, well, just see a tail or anything. If they say black tip, we know it's a lynx because that will just stand out. And when I show you slides here as we go along, keep an eye open and you'll see how that black tip shows out. And that's the real confirming piece of evidence that they're seeing a lynx and not a bobcat. Uh, here's some, I uh, did a lot of work up in Washington state with the friends of the Loomis uh, forest. And they have uh, probably the largest concentration now of lynx in the lower 48 and a lot of trail camera stuff. So I'm gonna show you a couple of their shots. What sticks out? There's that black tip on the tail. Here's another, oh, do you see that? Black tip all the way around the tip of the tail. Well, the cats are secretive. They use cover whenever they can. This happens to be a cougar moving through the cover, but the lynx are just as secretive, just as elusive, which makes them hard to um, see, to study, and a rare opportunity. Uh, all the cats leave claw marks on the trees, just like your house cat claws on your um, couches at home. And those are markings. There's some scent pads on the bottom of their feet that I think they can probably smell a little bit with. And here's a set on a aspen tree. Now other animals claw the trees, your bears, uh, your weasel family. And the difference is that you get a needle sharp drag marks the claws of the cats are needle sharp. They pull them back in to protect them. Whereas the claws of a bear, the claws of a uh, black bear started about three to five millimeters wide and grizzlies though, four to seven millimeters. So you see drag marks coming in, tail marks coming out. That's a telltale sign that you're dealing with a cat that's doing the actual clawing. All these animals are scent markers. Cats smell better than they're given credit for. And typically they use their cheek glands to mark stuff. Uh, and if we're out tracking in the snow and we see a set of tracks coming near a tree, we would go over and look at this height to try to find hairs from the cheek marking. I just love it. People say, oh, my house cat, I, he loves me. So every time he, I come home every night, he rubs up against my leg. Uh, well, he's rubbing up against the leg to say he's possessing you folks. Uh, they do their scent marking. That hairy foot leaves a very difficult to interpret footprint. That's generally three to four inches wide. You can kind of sort of make out toes, but the hair on it makes it very difficult to spot in the snow to understand it. Now let's do a little bit here on some lynx ecology. Where are the lynx? Well, historical records are very uh, difficult to interpret because many people did not know the difference between a lynx and a bobcat. And fur buyers, when they buy a mountain bobcat fur, they call it a lynx cat. So people use three different terms, oftentimes intermingling them on the same creatures. 24 states claim that they have had lynx in them in the past. 
We've investigated the museum specimens on every one of those we could, photos, written records, and uh, many of those are no question confused with bobcats. The amount of links in the past and the number of states is probably much lower than the number that claim they had them. In Montana, uh, trapping records show that about 3,500 were trapped in the, uh, from 1900 to 1999. Uh, Montana was the last place they could be trapped. Minnesota, about 3,000. Now in both these states, take up the big grain of salt because people didn't really know the difference between a lynx and a bobcat. Idaho didn't even bother to try to distinguish them, even though they had trapping. And in Wyoming, the lynx was considered a predator until 1973, which meant somebody could go and shoot a lynx and didn't have to report it. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of hinders our record keeping to say the least. Today we have lynx in Washington State, Montana, Wyoming, Minnesota, and Maine. Those are the only five states that have the lynx. Now, what do the lynx need out there? They need food, first off, and the key element, snowshoe hair. It helps to have red squirrels, it helps to have birds, but hair are the critical element. If the lynx don't have a hair every 24 to 48 hours, they will uh, starve to death. Their lean bodies do not store fat and they have to re uh, eat regularly and pick up in particular vitamin A from the hairs. So anytime we have a drop in the hair population, that leads to uh, problems with reproduction for the lynx and the lynx starving and starvation happens to be the leading cause of death. What do lynx need in terms of habitat? They need cool, they need snow, they need high elevation. Hey, that sounds like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. They need coniferous forests. Yeah. Uh, spruce fir, spruce subalpine fir, lodgepole, and on the west slope, western red cedar and dug fir are key elements to the habitat. But more important than just having the tree is the structure of what's there. Lynx don't um, den up in dens. What they do is they use old growth forests, which have a lot of uh, mature forests that are falling down. And so there's a lot of dense down wood and they will den up against logs that are on the ground. Uh, but in general, they're not looking for a den site like a bobcat or a cougar wood. They want this old down growth for their den sites. They also need good habitat for their prey. Well, that main prey is the snowshoe hare and they need visual cover. What that means is for a hare, it has to have dense enough uh, conifers that animals looking horizontally across the snow surface are not likely to see them, but also that they have enough timber above them, what we call vertical cover, so that the predators flying above won't see them. The snowshoe hare needs edges and ski areas actually make good edges because they've cut out ski areas in summer, you get great grass growth for the hares, but they can retreat into the forest for their cover, their visual cover. Young dense aspen stands are good because they also produce a lot of grass and herbs. They're generally wet even towards the end of the season, uh, summer season when things start to dry out. They also need trees that are poking above the snow level. Now this is important. When you have a regrowth of trees, say after the fires in Yellowstone or after the massive logging in uh, Maine, as soon as the trees get old enough that they poke above the average snow depth and go up a foot or two to provide horizontal cover, horizontal visual cover, then the lynx can start taking advantage of that. Well, it helps to have squirrels too. They help, but they, are no substitute for the lynx. They just help put the frosting on the cake, so to speak. And squirrels love uh, layered trees and old stands, some younger ones and some older ones growing up. But of course, cone producing trees, um, your spruce trees, particular white bark, limber pine, those are very good for the squirrels. The snowshoe hares turn white in the winter as do certain jackrabbits. So the white color in the winter is not uh, distinctive only to our snowshoe hair. Well, first I'm gonna start by taking it down to Colorado where I got my career started on chasing the Canada lynx. Colorado was a very instrumental state. 
in Colorado, uh, they the state designated the Canada Lynx and the Wolverine <coughs> as state endangered species, excuse me. And the state of Colorado also instigated a program called a income tax checkoff fund. If you were receiving a refund, you could check off $1 to go to non-hunted, non-trap species research. The hunters were happy to pay for research on deer and elk. The things they couldn't harvest, like lynx and wolverine, they didn't want to pay, but the non-game checkoff fund was very instrumental in producing funds and the opportunity to do research there. And I picked up the first three years, a total of $80,000 to do research. And back then $80,000 went a lot farther than it does today. So we started searching and we searched during the winter time uh, for tracks because that's one thing the lynx has a hard time hiding. And here you see typical tracks that have the round leading edge and they're indistinct. Over here is a nice set of walking lynx tracks with a six inch ruler. And you see the hair drag alongside the feet. So the tracks are fairly di diagnostic when you find them. As the winter wears on and the hair starts to break off the foot, you start seeing the naked pads. And this is a foot of a lynx. This is the foot of a bobcat. In the bobcat, you'll see the interdigital pad takes up a great proportion of the footprint. In the Canada lynx, that pad is very small in reference to the whole footprint. For the Canada lynx, the naked pads are reduced so they don't conduct energy to the snow. And the foot has a very heavy coat. As I say, the fur breaks off towards spring and you get a clearer footprint. Well, I wanna kind of give you a feel of the effort it takes to find Canada lynx. They're pretty rare. So from 1979 through 1991, I chased Wolverine and Lynx. In 79 and 80, we started with the non-game non income tax checkoff fund. In those years, my assistants and I, we covered 4,000 miles. Uh, primarily, we were looking for Wolverine, but during those 4,000 miles each winter, on snowmobiles, skis, and snowshoes, we recorded and looked for any Lynx. 15 days of the winter, we specifically worked prime habitat for the lynx. In 79, we found lynx at one location and three track sets in 4,000 miles. In 80, we had five lynx. Then they tried to put a new ski area in at Quail Mountain, worked there uh, at Quail, um, specifically for lynx and wolverine, 211 miles, 200 miles, um, 11 days of research, nine there, no lynx. Down in Vail, they were trying to double the size of Vail ski area and I lived on top veil, and in the mornings, they would tow me out behind a snowmobile and drop me, and I would ski the areas where the proposed ski area was. Got 189 miles of skiing in there, 13 days. I got nine sets of links, three different days, two tracks on one day, two on another, five on another. East Fork of the, of the San Juan was another proposed ski area. I got one winter there, uh, 339 miles and picked up two links. So just to play with a few numbers, that's always fun. Total miles over that time was over 9,000. Total miles specifically for looking for links, uh, not just links Wolverine, 1,200. And 73 days uh, looking where we could have had the links, total of 19 track sites. So 494 miles per track set. And on the links specific days, it was still 65 miles between track sets, or 3.8 days of research of skiing and working to find the lynx. Well, uh, in Colorado, I ran into two fights. Uh, the first fight was um, at Vail Ski Area, and they brought in the ex-dean of the School of Forestry from the University of Maine. His name was Horace Quick, we called him Har. Har was one of the grand old naturalists. Har was the head of the 10th Mountain Division during World War II. And at the end of the war, he got on a dog sled in 1945 in Northwest Alaska. And three years later, he came out in Northeast Canada. And he filmed that all on eight millimeter film. And he lived with the Inuit during that time. And Har got up in front of the judge in the court and said, well, all this experience I've got, incidentally, Har physically built, um, trained, 
uh, Tap Tapley, who physically built Colorado Outward Bound. But anyway, Har got up there and he rocked back and forth in front of the judge. He said, you know, in all my years up there with the Inuit, they couldn't tell a lynx track from a bobcat track. Don't know why this young whippersnapper thinks he can. Ooh, that's powerful testimony. But we were able to prove to the judge that we actually had lynx. And down on the East Fork of the San Juan, they brought in an old trapper. And he said, well, back to 1951, I snow uh, snowshoed up the eight miles into that canyon. I set out my tracks next to the road and I never caught no lynx. By 1964, I got one of those new things, the snow machine. I snowmobiled up there, set out my traps, never caught no lynx. There ain't no lynx up there. Well, we snowmobiled up the eight miles. Then we got on our skis and we climbed from 8,000 feet to 11,000 feet where the timber was so thick and the spruce fir forest, we could hardly put our skis between them. And that's where we found the lynx. He was looking in the wrong habitat. Well, state of Colorado um, felt that they were losing the lynx and they got involved with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the government. And if you want to learn about the lynx, you can go to the Mountain Prairie uh, dot fish and wildlife service dot government, click on the species tab, the mammals tab and the lynx. And they're the ones that keep track of uh, what's going on with the lynx. Uh, State of Colorado said, after I left there, they I trained the Colorado Division of Wildlife. And the first winter, they got three lynx, second winter, none. And after that, they couldn't find any more. So the state of Colorado declared that the lynx was extirpated. Uh, in other words, extinct from the state. Uh, with that, that opened up the way with the Fish and Wildlife Service to start reintroduction of the candle lynx to the state of Colorado. And they brought in four shipments of lynx and radio collared them, turned them loose and lynx scattered to the four corners. And we now know some of them, they were all trapped in Canada, live trapped in Canada. Some of them went back to Canada. <coughs> Well, here's part of the trapping scene that was going on there. This is a candle lynx, and this is in its cage where it was put after it was trapped. The door is open here. Now, what you'll see is the lynx is so scared of being out that it doesn't want to leave its secure home. So the trapper walks around and gets in front of it. And now the lynx is worried about that person, and he starts backing out. Backing out, back at, oops, wait a minute, I'm not in there anymore. And off he goes, just see that black tail. Well, uh, we will come back to the Colorado reintroduction because it has some important information for Yellowstone National Park here in a few minutes. Currently in the United States, there are five places where we have candle links, Maine, uh, Minnesota, and actually we had a few right here at the corner of that square on Michigan, Wisconsin. Uh, Washington, Idaho, and Yellowstone areas. I have worked on the links in all five areas. I trained people how to find links in all five areas over the years. In 2000, finally, the conservation people got the Canada lynx listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And also in 2000, though, the U.S. Forest Service, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, and BLM got together on what we call a conservation strategy. And a conservation strategy is a cooperative plan among federal, state, and tribal agencies to protect a species. It's a very powerful conservation move, but it's also been used a bit against the ESA listing as a threatened species. Some people who would like to, again, hunt and trap the lynx and said, well, if the conservation strategy, it doesn't need to be listed anymore. I will argue it still does need to be listed. <clears throat> and the Fish and Wildlife Service, we've had a lot of legal bouts with them over this listing, but right now it is still listed. Now, that's just a fun little website for you, the Canada Lynx in the Great Lakes region. And why I'm bringing this one up, which is nrri.universityofminnesota.edu, has this link over here that says, listen to the recordings. And this is pretty neat. They have uh, recordings made in the zoo of Canada lynx, but they make a lot of pretty interesting sound. 
And incidentally, if you're madly trying to copy down some of these emails, shortly after this presentation, we will have this uh, video of the presentation up on YouTube. Right now, if you go to YouTube and search on my name, Jim Halfpenny, you'll find a lot of our Wolf, uh, Wolverine, Lynx, Cougar presentations there already. Well, as we all came together under the Western Forest Carnivore Committee, this was an ad hoc, hoc committee of Canadians and Americans who were told to find out how many Wolverine, Fisher, Martin and Lynx there were in the United States and Canada. Uh, my job was to teach people how to identify the tracks and find the animals. Well, Lynn Ruggiero put together the scientific background on the ecology and conservation of lynx in the United States. And uh, I highly recommend this. It used to be downloadable at this uh, website. I haven't checked lately. I hope it's still there. Very excellent book on the uh, ecology, biology, and conservation and management of the lynx. Well, this brings us now to Yellowstone National Park. And in Yellowstone, uh, we had Carrie Murphy, who had been working on the Wolf Project, Carrie Gunther, uh, the bear biologist. And I convinced them that we ought to be looking at lynx. Well, Carrie had done his PhD on the cougars of Yellowstone, and Carrie was pretty darn skeptical. He'd never seen a lynx here, and there couldn't be any lynx. But I had my background on chasing lynx, and I said, yes, there is. So the three of us wrote a proposal, and we got funded um, for three years of research in the Canada lynx. Hired Tiffany Potter. Tiffany was one tough person. And she run our winter and summer programs for three years. And a lot of the success of the program has to go to Tiffany. Well, a little historical background on Canada Lynx and Yellowstone. Uh, there are a few records and a few photographs. This series of photographs and several others are of all the same links down at Lake Hotel in 1973 and 74. Uh, these were taken by Jerry and Cindy Mernon. Jerry has passed on now. Uh, he was one of the great uh, law enforcement rangers of Yellowstone National Park. In fact, the park was sometimes called Mernon's Park. Uh, and I worked with him a lot in the southern half of the park and it, uh, my tribute to Jerry. But what I want you to notice on all three photographs, well, with two you can really see, is this animal has lost part of its ear. And that allowed us to identify that animal in photographs of other people. Well, back in 73, 74, things were a little mm -hmm. different. I started working here in 1970 and rules and things were quite a little different. And they actually had bird feeders out at Lake Hotel and they were feeding the birds all winter and the lynx learned to prey on the birds coming to the bird feeders. Historically, the earliest report of a sighting we have is in the 1870s. And um, from uh, the 1870s on there's 75 reportings, I guess 1883 on, 75 reports of lynx sightings. There is one museum, specimen museum, several good uh, <coughs> photographs. And in the Meldrum al album, there's this photograph right here, obviously of a candle lynx. And if you study it carefully, he's in a leg hold trap. Uh, this is labeled uh, Slough Creek or Pebble Creek. I don't remember which one, it was one of the two. And um, Mary Marr used to tell me, well, obviously, if it was trapped on Slough Creek, it was trapped outside the park, but uh, we don't know that for sure. But if it was trapped outside the park, it was only two yards across the boundary, I think. So it's pretty good proof of the links in the area. Uh, this map shows all the links reports that we were able to uh, come up with starting in 1987 to the uh, current time. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is the reports do correspond to where we have travel routes in general, but here's a good amount over at West, the good amount down here at the north end of the park and up here at the northeast corner. I also wanna draw your attention to the lack of reports down in the southwest corner. Well, early on uh, back in uh, late 90s, early 2000, uh, John Squires and several folks radio collared some links down in the Wyoming range, which is south of the Grand Tetons. And they radio collared two links there, uh, the uh, one male and one female, and two different winters. The male made this trip 
which we could verify by radio locations up through the park and then back to the Wyoming range on two different falls. And then it passed on. That's interesting to me uh, that it did that incredible distance of exploring because normally we think of the home range of a lynx being about four, oh, four miles max uh, in radius, more like four miles in diameter. And here's this long trip. It intrigues me, either the lynx was looking for a mate and didn't find any, or exploring and didn't find a reason to stay in the Yellowstone area. So this is the fall before the snow set in, in 2001. First thing we did was we looked at Yellowstone National Park, which has 890,000 hectares. And we looked at everywhere where lynx wouldn't really like to live. And that's what you see here in red. Although there was good forest, Prior to 79, uh, 79 on through the fires, we lost 485,000 hectares, no longer lynx habitat. So this area in red is not lynx habitat. Willows along the river, that's good habitat. The conifer, aspen forest, and joint uh, edges between them is good, 276,000. So we figured there are 278,000 hectares of land in Yellowstone that were good lynx habitat. Next, we color-coded the lynx habitat. If it was a uh, good climax forest, spruce fir, that was high quality lynx habitat. Lodgepole pine forest in middle or late stages, that's medium quality. Low quality was straight aspen, straight white bark with dug fir. All stages and climax uh, for us for, for, uh, for fir. So all these are lynx habitat, but we're just looking at the quality of the habitat with the best being green on our stoplight scenario here. Then we mapped out Yellowstone. And what I want you to notice is the largest concentration of good lynx habitat is here. And remember, we had quite a few historical dots in here. Down here on the Pitchstone Plateau is medium quality, but we used three helicopter drop camps in here and found no signs of lynx. Uh, we had 37 ski routes across the park. Up here at the north entrance, uh, that's low quality, except for some areas of spruce fir. So really the best part is here in the center part of Yellowstone to the East Gate. <clears throat> Here's the uh, original map. Every one of these numbers is one of our ski routes. We ended up with 37 of them and helicopter drop camps. Three of them dropped our people in the back country for links of looking for tracks. Original plot was we would ski each of these twice each winter but that turned out to be too huge of a task. Law enforcement helped us by skiing routes and we had volunteer teams, all sorts, but still we didn't get all the routes done in any winter. And most of them were just one trip. Tiffany here looking at a set of Lynx tracks uh, and you see the Lynx track doesn't have much detail, but it's a short walking stride. And we do what's called a pillar test by escalate, uh, excavating around it then cleaning the snow off the top. And you can see that round padded foot of the links. We also did 1,029 miles of airplane surveys. 1,015 were specifically for links. And this shows each of the areas um, and the routes that we flew over those looking for the Canada links. And we had one to four surveys over the three winters. Actually, we managed to work three and a half winters on it. We saved enough money out of the three years grant to get a, another half winter. We placed cameras where we could, and we also placed hair snags out there to see if we could pick up animals. We placed these in prime habitat. And this is a hair snag location. Now a hair snag is a piece of carpet and we soak that in super catnip. Uh, the super catnip, there were two competing formulas at the time one by um, a biologist who had his own private stuff and one by the Forest Service. But it was kind of expensive to make. It had uh, catnip oil in it. It had beaver caster to keep the oil fresh and from freezing too solid. It had um, a couple other ingredients. And so the Forest Service said if we would use Forest Service protocol, they'd give us that for free. So we took that for free. You see a bottle of it here. And what we do is soak carpet like you have on your floor in the catnip, 
and then we would put nails through it facing out and nail it to a tree. Now cats are visually attracted, so we used pieces of ribbon, and this is a pie plate, tin pie plate, on fishing line with a swivel in here so it'll spin. Well, we had to test out to see if this was going to work. So we got ourselves a rental lynx and brought it to Mammoth. This is a rental lynx. Notice those long legs. Took it up and set up a set of tests. And notice the spinning pie plate. Caught its attention immediately. And then it goes right over to the carpet that's soaked in super catnip. And you can tell it's quite attractive there. You see the nails sticking out, but that's all right. It's scent marking and going after the cat now. I want you to notice the big feet in this video as you're watching also. <coughs> well, the purpose of this is the nails sticking out, pull hair out of the animal, and the carpet grabs it and holds it. So we would go to our hair snags and pull the hair off and do DNA testing to see what we got. And we did get three or four lynx this way, a couple of bobcats and a couple of cougars. The reason we didn't get more bobcat and cougars is because we placed these in prime lynx habitat way up where the snow was very deep. Things that bobcat and uh, cougars don't like. Cats are spray markers. They will back up to something and spray urine on it. So in a minute here, you're going to see the cat now. It will go ahead and spray urine on this spot. Oh, it just loves that, doesn't it? This video is two minutes long, and you see how long it spends on the scent carpet. Look at those long legs. A lynx is a bobcat on stilts. Okay, here comes the marking. It'll be quick. Moves around, and boom, it's scent mark. Oh, I hate it so when I piss on my foot. Next, we tested it by putting down powdered cat mark nip right here that we'd bought in the grocery store. And this is a carpet with nothing on it. And what's it do? It goes to the powdered cat nip that we got just down at the Albertson's grocery store. Okay, in a moment, you're gonna see the owner and the cat saying goodbye to her. She says this just the way it says goodbye. It's not scratching her. And for those that know him, that young fellow is a young Carrie Murphy there. Okay, so it worked. And we started setting out hair snag locations around the park. And we set out two kinds of hair snag locations. One we called subjective. That's where we went in and placed them in what we considered to be the best habitat available. You can see a lot of red triangles up here at the northeast corner, down here by Tower Roosevelt, over um, uh, um, above Mammoth. And then we used the National Links Detection Protocol, NLDP. This is what the Forest Service had set up. And that's what they had said, if you will use our catnip, uh, we'll give you the catnip free if you will use our protocol, which meant we had to set up a grid. And you notice the grid down here in that prime habitat that is on the um, east side of Yellowstone Lake. You also notice that we set out some subjective hair snares there. And over here, we put out some subjective hair snares. Regretfully, the fire, uh, we had camera stations in here on the east side also. Regretfully, the fires in 2002 took out our uh, setup in here. We lost most of it and weren't able to continue there. Uh, this is a detailed look at the stations we placed for the hair snare survey. We had 35 of them here. 
And this is a task. We would put out the hair snares for one month only. That was the protocol. And we would place them, leave them alone for a month and pick them up. So Tiffany Potter and her summer crews did all this work. This is a massive project to hike to each of these exact spots. And at each spot, we put out multiple hair snares. Not only that, you're carrying this smelly stuff in your pack, which could be a bear attractant. And the uh, Lynx team, in fact, ran into a fellow who had been mauled by a grizzly, managed to get him to the shore and call for help. And we got a boat across the lake and saved the fellow's life during that part of the project. But this is the area, again, that the fires took out most of our effort, and that was one of our prime spots. So give you a little bit of an idea on the results we got. We classified them in two ways. They were a definite result if we had DNA information on them. If we had perfect tracks, but no DNA, we would call them probable. If we had good tracks, they were possible. So what you see is we actually found more animals by tracking than by hair snares. But you see, we had three definites here on the east side. We had probables here. This one down at Old Faithful is definitely, I think, a probable. Uh, the tracks and everything were very good when I found them, but I was evacuating a woman who had uh, fallen on her skis and broken her cheekbone. And so I was skiing uh, her down, uh, 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 kind of helping her on skis get down to Old Faithful. And we were coming down the trail that runs on the east side of the Firehole River. And just where we left the road, I had perfect lynx tracks in there, but I didn't have time to photograph them or document them or anything. So this is our results from 2000 to 2004. Now, some other interesting stuff. Uh, in the park, we ended up with seven lynx. One of the lynx was a female who had a male kitten. And that one was just uh, on the west side of the lake. We followed her um, up to where she had a day bed. And in the day bed, we had big lynx and little lynx tracks. We got um, male DNA on the hair. So that proved it was a male kitten. And that was the first proof of reproduction in the ecosystem in decades. Up north here, we've got a definite and a probable. This was our lynx crew up above, they'd gone to Chico to party for the weekend and they went skiing and found those. Wyoming Game and Fish found these over here and had definite DNA on. And then there was a crew, one of our folks from the first year went to Jackson and formed his own search crew and they got links in uh, a possible here in 2004 and a probable in 2004. Then in 2005, they picked up a lynx right here at the tip of the arrow that lynx, uh, we got DNA on, and the DNA of that lynx matched the DNA that we had picked up up here on the east side of Yellowstone Lake. Okay, news break, news break, news break. What's a happening now? Well, Fred Polson, one of the Zantera workers, on November 26th of 2007, was snow coaching down by Burl Hot Springs when he managed to grab this picture. What catches your eye, folks, right there? But be eagle-eyed, you also see there might be a possibility of a radio antenna there. And followed the links out, and whoa, that looks like a radio collar, doesn't it? With an antenna, and the links goes out, and oh, isn't that great? Look at that. Big tufts, beautiful black tail tip looking straight at us. And so that was Burl Hot Springs. And there's a close up of that lynx. Ah, great. Then in 2010, Larissa Forseth, um, just as we opened the roads up uh, that year, she was driving past Indian Creek Campground. And lo and behold, she sent a photo in and she sent it to Carrie Gunther and uh, said, I don't know what this is. What do you guys think it is? Well, this is uh, her photograph. This is my. Uh, verification of the site. Notice these branches, for instance, go right there. And uh, so Larissa um, sent this in. Carrie looked at it and says, well, it looks like Lynx. He said it to me. And there was one that was closer up. Um, and I could see a crease in the fur. And I said, this, that crease has to be a radio antenna. 
So can I contact Larissa? And I did. I said, well, Larissa, did you happen to get any other photographs? She says, oh, yeah, I shot a whole slew of photographs. I'll send you a CD with them. And I said, well, OK. And a while later, I get this CD in the mail, and it's from NCIS. Now, for you television fans who know the best television program on, that's Naval Criminal Investigation Service. And I thought, uh-oh, somebody's jerking my chain here. So I looked her up on the internet. Turned out Larissa was the leading civilian agent in the NCIS. And she had just been driving through the park with her camera gear and got the pictures. Well, there's a little more to that story. Larissa's parents bought a ranch down near Immigrant. And Larissa's brother was shot up bad in Afghanistan. And so the ranch down there is a rehabilitation ranch for recovering uh, PTSD folks from the wars. Well, Larissa sent extra photographs. How's that, folks? See that fur, but the pad is starting to be revealed. More importantly, when you see here, you see the anal opening with the um, vaginal opening, and they're very close together. That's a female. If we're a male, the penis would come out clear down here. So she got a female, and see that ridge right there? That's collar-like, and you can kind of make out the collar underneath there. Ooh, there it is, folks. That's an antenna. And there's the collar. So now becomes the question, could this be the same length that uh, was recorded at Burl Hot Springs? Since then, uh, since Larissa got this in three different winters, we've had very good lynx tracks at Indian Creek Campground in the winter in that area and have done some long tracking surveys on them. Well, as soon as we saw the radio collar, we contacted everybody collaring lynx. Up in Northwest uh, Montana, at Sealy Lake, they had a collaring project going on. And we said, you know, could this be one of your links? And they said, no, we know exactly where all of our links are. Well, we contacted Colorado. Remember, Colorado was doing that reintroduction. And we said, uh, could this be one of your links? And it took them about between two and three months to get back to us. And they sent us some radio frequencies that they were missing. So we gave the frequencies to everybody that was flying with radios the Wolf Project, the Bear Project, uh, Sheep Project, everybody had a radio on stuff. And we never did get a lynx on the radio. A couple of possible explanations. Batteries had gone dead, collar maybe got lost, or they just passed through. Uh, the Colorado people denied that they'd had lynx coming, uh, migrating out of the state really. Well, short time later, two lynx were killed in, uh, in Canada and lo and behold, they were radio collared lynx from Colorado. Uh, a couple of years after the project, I got a look at the radio collar map for Colorado and several of the lynx went north from Colorado, passing through or on both sides of Yellowstone and back to Canada. So we don't know the origin of this lynx, but we do know we had one here in the park. I think that's fair turnaround because one of our Wolverines went to Rocky Mountain National Park spare that we got some links out of the deal. Quite a sight for here in the park. Okay, that uh, wraps up the program.